Hi everyone, my name is Andreas. I'm an engineer at Twig. Uh, Twig is a really exciting place to work at. Um, if you're interested, check with us in the Twig channel uh, later on, or take a look at our website, twig.io, uh, or write to hello at twig.io. Um, today I have the pleasure to present some work that we've been doing at Twig over the last couple of years, uh, namely our work on building Haskell with Bazel. Um, if you have any questions along the line, uh, feel free to just interrupt me in Zoom. That's going to be easier for me than to try to follow uh, the Discord as well. Um, so with that, that's, that's uh, going to it. Um, so first of all, a brief summary about uh, Bazel. Uh, Bazel is an open source build system developed by Google. Uh, it's based on Google's internal build system, uh, Blaze, that they use to uh, build their a uh, huge monorepo, and uh, correspondingly, Bazel is designed to handle large monorepositories. Bazel's tagline is uh, fast and correct, choose two. So Bazel has a precise dependency graph. It tracks the dependencies between your targets and uh, their actions uh, very precisely and uh, builds our sandbox to ensure that these dependency definitions are correct. Uh, with that, Bazel can provide cached builds and tests, uh, both locally and uh, it also supports remote caching. Um, Bazel has parallel execution of the uh, various build and test steps, um, either by just uh, local parallelism or, uh, in principle, uh, Bazel also supports remote execution. Um, and, of course, Bazel provides uh, incremental builds and tests, meaning that uh, if you had built your repository and then you made some small change and you rerun the build or some tests, then Bazel will only rerun the parts that actually uh, changed. Um, as mentioned before, Bazel supports uh, large monorepositories and it supports polyglot monorepositories, meaning um, projects in which you have different components written in different languages that interdependent in, in some ways. Uh, and uh, Bazel is extensible with custom user-defined build rules uh, to support additional languages. And you can express the dependencies between your components in different languages within the same system. Um, it also supports multiple platforms. So Bazel itself runs on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And it supports cross-compilation uh, to, it also has an extensible mechanism to define the target platforms there. Um, so what's uh, Twig's involvement been with Bazel? Uh, Twig is an early adopter uh, of Bazel since early 2018. Uh, we're recognized as a Bazel community expert uh, by Google. And uh, we've been an active contributor uh, of new Bazel features and also uh, open source Bazel extensions. Um, our extensions are, first of all, rules Haskell, uh, which is a Bazel rule set to build Haskell code. Uh, then rules Next packages which is a rule set that allows to integrate the Nix package manager with Bazel. So you can use this to provision your system dependencies or system tool dependencies or things like that uh, with the Nix package manager and benefit from the uh, huge Nix packages repository. Um, and you can import those Nix uh, derivations into Bazel um, and this way have a fully hermetic uh, and reproducible setup, even including your system dependencies. And then uh, there is another smaller rule set, rules SH, uh, that we developed, which uh, is a small repository that allows you to define a tool chain uh, for a standard Unix shell command, so, you know, find, cat, set, these kinds of things. Um, so in this workshop, uh, we'll mostly look at code. Um, and the goal is to port an existing Haskell project uh, over to build with Bazel, and uh, to highlight some of the more interesting features um, I chose a polyglot project, in this case, a example project from the Haskell Servant um, project uh, that combines Haskell and Elm. So it's a servant backend written in Haskell um, and a, a front end written in Elm. It's a simple to do app. Um, and if you want to follow along, um, uh, there is a Git repository uh, under this uh, URI on GitHub. Um, so with that, Sorry, uh, could you uh, could you yeah. share the uh, GitHub link in the uh, tweet chat? Absolutely. Um, copy that. And there we go. 
All right. So uh, with that, off to the code. Um, fortunately, I have to do some swapping of windows. But I hope it's okay. So um, I hope you can see the code and the terminal uh, well. So this is the example servant Elm uh, project, more or less as you find it uh, in the in its original state. Um, I've made some small changes uh, and, and already uh, primed it a little bit to uh, speed up what we need in, in this workshop. Um, and uh, as mentioned before, you can uh, use Nix to provision your dependencies um, with Bazel. However, to sort of limit this uh, workshop to a single tool, I haven't set this particular project up with Nix. Uh, so if you are in a situation where you don't have all the dependencies available on your machine, I've provided a Docker file in the repository uh, that you can use uh, as with instructions in the readme uh, to, to build the project that way. Um, so first, let me give a brief overview of what this project is. Um, it's a backend and a front end. Uh, the backend is defined uh, in the server directory. Uh, there are uh, sources and there's some tests set up. Um, uh, it uses servant, so we're defining a REST API in uh, the servant type DSL. Um, and then for bindings to the front end, we're also using the servant Elm and Elm bridge packages to generate Elm bindings. Um, uh, then we're implementing uh, the REST API with a simple in-memory database for the tasks. Again, it's a simple to-do uh, app. Um, and we're serving static assets like the Elm front end and an index HTML uh, using uh, just the, the Y uh, asset server. Um, then there are some tests written uh, in HSpec. And that's all for the backend pretty much. And then the front end or client as it's called here is written in Elm. Um, there is a small change I made uh, with respect to the original. I've split up the main.elm uh, into an app.elm and main.elm, which will make it easier to run the tests later with uh, the Elm extension for Bazel. It's more of a technical detail. Um, and there are also some tests. And uh, an interesting aspect is that uh, since we're using Elm Bridge and Servit Elm, uh, we have to generate some Elm code based on Haskell code and then use this Elm code uh, to compile the front end. Uh, and then finally, there are the static assets where we'll put an index file and main JS into one directory to be served. Um, that's all for the components of the project. Um, so to convert this uh, project to Bazel, uh, as you can see in its original state, it's using make to um, combine the various needed tools. So it uses stack to build the Haskell parts, and it uses uh, the Elm compiler to build the front end parts, uh, as you can see here. And uh, we'll not use any of that, but instead uh, we'll use Bazel to build both the Haskell and the Elm parts uh, with the same tool. And we'll start with the backend component. So first build the Haskell code. And the very first thing we need to do uh, for that in Bazel is to import all the needed external dependencies. Uh, so every Bazel project has a workspace file as it's, at its root. And in there, uh, we define all the external dependencies that we have, and also some metadata about the project itself. Um, so the project uh, we'll name like this, and then um, as you can see, I've commented out some things to uh, make this part a bit easier to set up. So first of all, we need to import the Haskell rule set uh, just directly from GitHub. Um, and then uh, the rules Haskell project has some dependencies itself that we need to import uh, calling this rules Haskell dependencies macro. Um, and then we also need to uh, define which GHC version uh, we want to use and how we want to get it. Um, Rules Haskell, as I mentioned before, has Nix support, so we could in principle pull it in from Nix, but to limit this to one tool, uh, I'm using uh, the bindist mode. So we're going to download an 8.8.3 bindist of GHC and install it into the Bazel sandbox. 
And then our project has some external uh, stack dependencies, stackage dependencies. And to enable those, uh, we're using a, a rule that we call stack snapshot, which under the hood uh, downloads all the necessary stackage packages and builds them uh, with Cabal as needed. And the way this works is to give this a name. We just call it stackage. We tell it which stack is, uh, snapshot we want to use. Uh, to figure this out, I'm uh, basing this on the original project. So if we look at the original project, it had a stack.yaml file, which defined this uh, stackage snapshot, 15.9. Um, it pulls in some extra dependencies. Um, and uh, why make assets was a helper that was used to build the assets uh, using a make file. Uh, we're using make uh, we're using Basil instead, so we don't need that one. Um, and then following the package.yaml file, there are a couple more dependencies to this project uh, that we can just add here, uh, also to the tests that we can just add here. So, and I'll make sure that there are no duplicates. All right. Um, so this pulls in all the stackage packages that we have. Uh, now, one thing that we need to watch out for as well is that uh, the stackage package zlib has a dependency on the system library uh, zlib. So for that to work out, uh, we need to tell it where it can find zlib. And we're using a Bazel build version of that, uh, which is pulled in uh, down here. Um, with that one, I'll gloss over the details a little bit. Uh, but uh, we download the sources of the zlib package uh, from here. And then we tell Bazel how to build it using the built-in support for compiling C libraries. OK. There's a quick question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, does rules Haskell use stack internally uh, for building stack projects, or does it completely replace it? Right. Uh, so it does not use stack for the building part. Uh, it does use stack to uh, interface with the stackage snapshots to and to do the dependency resolution. So you'll notice that here we're only listing the direct dependencies of our project, either from the stackage snapshot or from package directly. Uh, there's also ways to import arbitrary uh, packages. Um, and then uh, we call out to stack uh, and let it do the resolving of all the transitive dependencies and the exact versions and tell us where the sources are. Uh, but then the actual downloading and building uh, we'll do with Bazel without stack. Um, in fact, that's the very next thing we'll do. So uh, let's say we want to build the uh, servant uh, package. Um, oops, build. Uh, then you'll see that it starts this fetching rules Haskell stack update. This is essentially uh, Bazel calling out to stack, running stack update, and then stack uh, resolve to, to resolve all dependencies, um, which is happening now. Um, this is going to take a while, so I've prepared a log file, um, which you can generate. Uh, it's, it's documented in the uh, rules Haskell box, so don't worry. You, have to, you don't have to remember all this by heart. Um, but you can generate a log file like this uh, using this command. So this will call out to stack once, uh, figure out all the metadata about transitive dependencies and so on, write it to a JSON file. And then in future, we don't need to call stack anymore. We just have it in that file uh, and can go directly from there. So if I now try this, oops, this basal build again, uh, this should proceed faster. And there we go. So this now built a uh, servant. Um, now you'll notice that this happened very quickly. Uh, there is no magic here. We, we cannot speed up Haskell compilation faster than GHC can do it by itself. Um, but what we're doing here is uh, Bazel supports caching. Um, and I've pre-populated a disk cache before uh, to make sure that during this workshop, we don't have to constantly wait for GHC to compile stuff. Uh, so all the servant dependencies and everything were already in the, in the cache. 
Um, oops. So now that we've uh, pulled in these external dependencies, uh, the next thing we'll want to do is define the actual uh, build of the uh, server backend. And uh, this we do in build files. Uh, so, so far we've seen the workspace file, which is in charge of all the external dependencies of the project. And then the build files are where you define all the targets that are local uh, to your project. And the way this works is that you first import any basal rules that you might need to build targets like Haskell library or Haskell binary here. Um, and now we'll go through step by step. So the first thing we want to define is a Haskell library target for the API uh, module. Um, and the first thing we need to do is we need to give it a name, just API. Uh, we need to tell it which sources uh, we would like to compile. Um, and then we need to tell Basil what dependencies this target has. Um, as most Haskell modules, it's going to depend implicitly on the base. Um, then we can see by the import list oops, that we also depend uh, on servant and that we depend on Elm bridge. Uh, so I'll add those. go. And now let's see if this builds. Basil build server. Oops, server. And we see there is some error. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Um, I mean the API target. Okay. So now we've seen how Basil build that API. Um, the next thing we want to build in here is the app. Uh, library. Um, one thing you'll notice compared to, for example, Cabal project is that we're using very fine grained targets here. Uh, so the API module is becoming its own library, the app module is becoming its own library. We could also use a single library target to uh, bundle all of those in, uh, in, one, uh, in one go, but uh, here I'll, I'll go for a more fine grained uh, approach. Um, right, so now the exercise is repeated. We need to add all the import, uh, all the dependencies to this target. Um, it's base again, and then it's containers since we depend on uh, data map and uh, servant server. And y and also y app static. So let's try to build oops, build this server source app. And we're getting an error here saying that y app static is not visible. So the reason is that it was not a dependency of the original project because it used this uh, make assets module instead of our package. So I neglected to add it to the stack package uh, dependencies here. And only the ones that are listed here as direct dependencies are made visible by default. So even though it may be a transitive dependency somewhere, we have to add it to this list to be able to use it. Um, right, so now uh, we've built all that. And the next array is that API is missing. Uh, because, of course, we also need to depend on our local API library that we defined just up here. And with that, that works. Um, okay, so now we've compiled the main library modules uh, of this server component. And finally, we want to define the binary. Um, the exercise is much the same as before just that this time the sources is the main uh, module and depths is the app library from above and base again and warp. Okay, 
So let's now basal build so the, the server binary that works. And if we run it, that works, and it's telling us that it's listening on port 3000. OK, so I'll quickly switch over to the um, Zoom lets me switch over to the browser. There we go. And the browser is here. Okay. So now if we load localhost 3000, we'll find file not found. And the reason is, of course, that we haven't actually built the front end yet. So uh, the back end cannot find any of the assets it needs to serve. So we'll go back to the code. This one. OK, we'll stop the server. And now we'll look at the client side. So the client is an Elm project. Uh, but it also uses uh, this um, Elm bridge and Elm code generation. So we'll start with that part. And the way we do this is first we build a Haskell binary um, that builds the generate Elm module in the same directory, uh, which is defined here. Um, and then we're calling what is called a gen rule, um, which you can think of as a way to define a target that just up executes arbitrary shell code. Um, so we call it API source. Uh, we say it should generate this api.elm file. Um, we need to define the inputs, but there aren't any. Um, and then we need to define, define the tools that we depend on, which in this case is this generate Elm binary. And we need to define the command that we want to run. And what we want to do is we want to execute the generate Elm binary, and it's going to produce a file under client source api.elm, which we then want to copy to the location that where Basil expects that, which similar to in make file, you have this dollar add variable to express that. And um, generate Elm. So Basil commands are executed in the repository root always. So this path is not going to be correct, correct right away. Um, so Basil has this uh, feature called location expansion, uh, where we can tell it, give me the execution path uh, of this target. OK. So let's first try to build this generate Elm uh, Haskell binary. Uh, we do have a visibility error again. So and Basil tracks visibility of targets. And if you attempt to access a target that does not have the correct visibility, then Basil is going to give you an error. So the API we're just going to make publicly visible uh, to the whole project. OK. So generating this um, generate Elm binary worked. And now we can try to basically build the client API sources. And we see that we get an Elm file out, uh, which is auto-generated code for bindings to the servant API that we defined in Haskell code. Um, so we were able to express all this Haskell and code generation part in Basil directly. Um, now, the next step is to build the actual Elm code. Um, first, before we can do that, we need to import the Elm rule set. So this is something that not we have written. Uh, that's, that's not written by us at week, but it's an open source project. Uh, there are a few components we need. First of all, the Elm rules depend on Node.js. So we first need to install the rules Node.js uh, Basil extension to building 
uh, yeah, or building and running node code. Um, rules Elm also has a, a NPM dependency uh, called uglify.js. So we need to install that uh, in the package JSON and package log JSON files. And now we can import rules Elm. Uh, it's very similar to rules Haskell. So first we download the, uh, the rule set itself directly from GitHub. And uh, then rules Elm, uh, we need to define the Elm tool chain. Uh, so this is also going to download an Elm binary distribution and set it up for Bazel. Um, and then we depend on some Elm uh, packages that are tracked on the Elm package registry. And we can find out which dependencies those are by looking at the elm.json file. Uh, and then uh, the way this works in rules elm is that for each of those, you have to declare the dependency and tell Bazel exactly where to find this. Um, to reduce the boilerplate there a little bit, uh, I wrote a little script uh, that does this for us um, called uh, generate elm repositories. It's reading this elm.json file and generating uh, ECL file that defines all those dependencies. Um, so that generates a whole load of these calls to download the Elm package. So now we import this in the workspace file. Um, and with that, we're all set in the workspace. And we can continue building the Elm front end. Uh, first, the generated API library. So very similar to how you would build a Haskell library. Uh, you build an Elm library by giving it a name, uh, telling Bazel where it can find the sources, API SRC here. And then uh, for Elm module imports uh, to work in rules Elm, you also have to tell it which part of the file path relative to the repository group to strip before you can import uh, the library. So let's try to build this. Okay. Uh, Elm driver is not defined, right? I forgot to uncomment the imports up here. Okay. So now we've built this Elm library. Um, then the next component we want to build is the app module and sources here. So to speed things up a little bit, I'm going to copy over the definition for this. It's the same kind of pattern. So we use the Elm library rule. We give it the name app. We tell it where to find the sources and the source strip prefix for imports. And then the dependencies, we depend on the generated API module above and these uh, packages from the Elm package registry. And again, if we try to compile this, this works. And finally, uh, what rules Elm calls the Elm binary. So that's the final JS file that's being compiled as sort of the front end entry point. Uh, we need to tell it the main module and the dependencies, the app module. And this happens to depend on an Elm package called Elm browser. Okay. So with that, we can build the main module and we get a JS file out, uh, which, uh, well, I mean, it's a complete JS file with all the runtime and, and all our code and everything we need uh, to run this front end. Okay, uh, any questions so far? If not, then I'll continue. Um, another thing uh, we can do is we can build and run tests. So uh, this example project defines a small test suite. And for that, we have an Elm test rule. Uh, where we again give it a name tests. We say that the main 
tests module is in this location. And we depend on um, this Elm Explorations test uh, package. So if we try to build that, we'll see that it built successfully and we run the test and this is all green. Now you'll notice that Bazel says cached here. And the reason for this is that Bazel can also cache test results themselves. So if nothing changed compared to a previously cached test run, then Bazel doesn't actually have to run the test anymore. Um, it assumes that uh, yeah, it's, if, it, if it didn't change, then it's going to succeed again. Uh, if for whatever reason we do really want to rerun it, we can tell Bazel to not cache test results to force it to rerun the test. And we can also tell Bazel to always output uh, from the test and we'll see what the, the, the Elm test runner reports. Okay. So now we've compiled the Elm frontend. Um, and now the final piece is to generate the assets and plug those together with the backend. Um, so for that, we'll go to the assets um, directory. And there we really just want to copy files into the same place and generate an index HTML. Um, so there are some convenience rules in a project called Bazel Skylift, sort of the standard library for Bazel. Um, and the first thing uh, we want to do is to copy the um, generated main JS file into this directory. And then uh, if you use standard Elm, then Elm would also generate a index HTML file for you, but uh, rules aim only uh, generates the JS file and you have to provide the index um, yourself. Uh, and in more involved projects, I think it's pretty common to have to write a custom index HTML anyway. So um, that doesn't seem too big of an issue. Um, and here we're using a convenience rule called write file, which just lets us generate this index HTML snippet, which is going to invoke uh, Elm. And then a bit of metadata, we uh, bundle those two files into a special target uh, called file group, a uh, special rule type called file group, uh, which sort of just assigns a single name to a collection of files. So now if we say Bazel build assets, uh, we have an issue in that the visibility of the main JS is not enough. So we'll change that. So you can also give sort of fine-grained visibility saying that only this package should be able to see this. And then we can see that uh, we're getting those two files built under the assets directory. <clears throat> hey, um, if this is for the moment, a quick question from the chat is that, uh, can we set up Bazel to build a project both with and without Nix? Yes, uh, that is possible. Uh, and in fact, that is how Rules Haskell itself is set up. Um, because Rules Haskell is sort of more of a library than an a, a end application, right? Uh, and so we want to be able to test all the different uh, supported use cases on CI. And so it's configured in a way where you can either build it with Nix if that's available uh, or without Nix if that's necessary. A uh, prime example of where that's definitely necessary is Windows. Um, so Rules Haskell also supports uh, Windows and, uh, I mean, sort of. Practically speaking, as of now, there is not really Nix on Windows available. So, um, any more questions at this point? All right. If not, then I'll uh, go to completing the server binary. 
So the last piece that's missing here really is that we only need to tell Bazel that at runtime, the server component is going to depend on the assets. And if we do that, and we Bazel run server source server, uh, we'll of course get a visibility issue first. So we need to make the assets visible. Like so. And now we can run the server. And I'll switch over to the browser again. Uh, is this window? Yep. Okay, and now if we reload this page, we uh, see that. Uh, it found the assets and we can add tasks uh, to, uh, to this app. Okay, so with that, uh, we've completed the back end and the front end and plugged them both together. Um, And sort of the remarkable part there is that we can express all these dependencies uh, in the same build tool that we also use to build the Haskell code and Elm directly. And Bazel can also schedule the builds and, and cache and all these uh, different kinds of targets uh, in different languages uh, using the same mechanisms. Um, now, another piece that we haven't looked at yet are the tests. Uh, these tests are defined using uh, HSpec. So let's try and build this test suite using Bazel and Bruce Haskell. There are two files to this uh, test suite, and the dependencies I'll just copy over to make this a bit quicker. So it's our API and app, and then a bunch of uh, uh, stackage dependencies like HSpec or uh, Servant. So let's try to build these tests. And uh, first of all, we'll find visibility issues again with app. And now we'll find that GHC complaints could not execute HSpec discover. Um, so this is interesting. Let's take a look at what's going on there. So if we look, look at the spec module, we'll see that it uses the uh, Haskell formatter HSpec discover, which is going to generate the actual content of this module uh, sort of on the fly. And uh, we need to express this dependency because uh, remember dependence, uh, dependencies are tracked explicitly and builds are sandboxed. So we need to provide HSpec discover to this target. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to import HSpec discover into our Haskell project. Um, and then a minor inconvenience, uh, stack does not, so we use, um, we interface with stack to extract metadata about the dependencies and stack does not currently tell us about what cabal components a package has. So we have to tell uh, Bazel explicitly that HSpec discover has a executable component and a library component and that we would like to build both of them. And if we do this, Uh, we can build the HSpec discovery, uh, discover binary. Okay. And now we can use this uh, as a tool during our build. So the way we express this is that we make um, stackage HSpec discover 
a tool dependency, meaning it's an executable that we want to run at build time. Uh, but now we need to tell GHC where to find this, under which path. Um, and I mean, we could in principle hard code this, but it's a bit, it's, it's not so pretty. Uh, so what we'll do instead is we'll use a little bit of uh, CPP um, to inject the path to the tool. And then we'll add a compiler option here. Yes, spec is cover. Again, uh, we'll use this location expansion to find the path of the binary. There we go. And now, hopefully, this test should build. It does indeed. Uh, for completeness, we'll also add the runtime dependencies of the assets and Oops. With that, the test should pass. And again, it's already cached, but if we force the cache, if we force Basil 2, it's going to rerun it and tell us uh, the output. Okay, so with that, we've also uh, completed the test suite and uh, we can test the entire project and see that both the backend and the front end tests pass and we also saw that the project runs. Um, so with that sort of the, the porting as such is complete. Uh, any questions about this um, so far? I have a quick question. Uh, so does it mean that uh, you don't need a cabal file anymore for your project or package YAML or anything like that? You can just specify everything in Bazel and build your project that way? That's right, yeah. You can toss away the cabal file uh, if you like. Um, now, we do have integration with cabal. So the external dependencies, the, the stack snapshot uh, dependencies, uh, those are being built with cabal. So we have dedicated rules called Haskell cabal binary and Haskell cabal library. And what they do is they uh, generate or use an existing setup.hs file and uh, run it and use Cabal, the library, uh, to build the package. Um, we've, uh, we've tried several approaches, and that turned out to be a very easy to set up and very robust approach. Because on Hackage, you find some packages that are really difficult to build um, without significant changes outside of Cabal. So the easiest way was to just use Cabal as is. Um, like they, they use custom configure scripts, custom setups, these kinds of things and are tightly coupled with a uh, cabal, system, uh, cabal system. So if you have something like this um, and you don't want to port it to Bazel right away completely, then you can um, use these cabal library rules in your project as well and build stuff with cabal in your project and it integrates with the standard Haskell rules. So you can depend uh, between those either way. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, I sort of have a small. Yeah, go ahead. Can you generate the like uh, some of the basal uh, files from a cabal file or something like that? Right. Uh, so in principle, this is something that is possible. Uh, we don't currently have a, a tool available for this yet. Uh, but it is something uh, that we're thinking about and working on. And uh, yeah, so hopefully uh, that's going to be available uh, at some point. And in, in principle, in the, so in the Bazel space as a whole, there are uh, some code generators for the build files. So Go is a um, very popular example where uh, the Go rule set um, uh, does build file generation uh, using a tool called Gazelle. Uh, based on the Go sources directly. Uh, so it seems in the chat there was another question about um, advantages or disadvantages over Nix. Um, 
So there is a bit of overlap between those two tools, but there are some uh, differences in how you use them in practice. So Nix is uh, primarily designed as a package manager, right? So you're talking about cor coarser grained um, targets. So if, if you look at your typical Nix derivation, you're not caring so much about individual files that are being generated in your build, but you're more working at the sort of the, the scale of the whole package and then how does uh, libc and libset and you know I don't know uh, stack and, and stuff like this how, how do these things interdepend um, whereas Basil is concerned about much more fine-grained dependency graph of your project really talking about individual files individual uh, libraries uh, these kinds of things um, so yeah there is there is a difference in sort of how they are for what kinds of use cases these tools are optimized um, and as mentioned before, with rules Nix packages, uh, we're able to combine Nix and Bazel to kind of get the best of both worlds. So we can use Nix uh, as a package manager uh, for those uh, more coarse-grained uh, dependencies to define our system dependencies. So maybe we don't particularly want to spend time uh, to define Bazel builds for, I don't know, libssl or something like this, uh, but we'd much rather have uh, Nix packages and Nix build it for us and then just import it into Bazel. Uh, and with rules and packages, we can do that. And then um, if you combine this with a shared Nix cache and a shared Bazel cache uh, that is say populated by CI, for example, then because your system dependencies are provided by Nix uh, on a pinned uh, Nix snapshot, assuming that you set this up correctly, um, then all your, de all your developers uh, can benefit from the same Nix and Bazel shared cache. So if you, if user A pushes some changes to CI and CI builds them and populates the cache, and then uh, user B pulls those changes and does a Bazel build locally, then you can download uh, the already built artifacts from the Bazel cache directly. You don't really have to build anything yourself if you're lucky. Um, okay. Then, uh, if there are no more questions, now I have a sort of um, last little uh, piece that's very nice uh, that I can show up. So we also have uh, integration with uh, GHCI uh, using a rule called uh, Hustle REPL, uh, which allows you to run a GHCI session with the dependencies of and then server itself loaded by source uh, into uh, GHCI. Um, and now you can combine uh, this uh, with the tool GHCID uh, to get an interactive development experience, uh, sort of. So there are two pieces we're going to use. One is Bazel Watcher, which is a tool that, given a Bazel command, uh, it finds all the file dependencies of that uh, target. And if any of those changes, it reissues a Bazel build. Um, so let's say if we go to the client um, and we change any of the sources here, to, for example, say a new item, then we'll find that Bazel rebuilt the front end. Um, and now we can run GHC ID, telling it where to find uh, the assets in this case, and that GHC ID should use this Bazel run command as the GHC entry point, and that it should run main and reload if anything changes under the assets directory. And now if we do this, and then um, we go into the server sources and change something like, for example, the uh, setup there. Oops. Like that. Now we saw the brief flicker there, so GHC ID was reloading. And if I go back to the front end, I can show you that uh, if I reload this now, uh, that we have preset it with the foo item here. Or if I go again uh, into the front end um, and do the same change, uh, of the add new item that I did before, and then reload, uh, then the button here has changed to add new items. So this way um, I can kind of set up an, a cross-language interactive development environment where changes uh, directly cause rebuilds or reinterpretation or reloading. 
uh, of the sources. So, okay, now a couple yeah. of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to have a look, I can also read them out. I'm just unsure if one of them maybe you already answered. Do you want me to read them out? Uh, let's see. Um, maybe yes. I yeah, so uh, try one to find the chat window. Mm -hmm. Are you building static binaries with recent THC at week? I've been trying to follow instructions on Haskell.build, but static Haskell Nix seems to have fallen a bit behind recently. Um, Right, so uh, there is um, support that we've uh, worked on um, together with uh, Habito, and we wrote a blog post uh, about this as well. Um, uh, I, I guess you saw that. Um, and uh, with that, we do have support for fully statically linked uh, Haskell binaries um, with uh, Muscle and using the Nix integration of uh, Muscle. So the way this has been set up has only been tested so far with a Nix-provided Haskell toolchain uh, that is built using uh, the static Haskell Nix um, environment. Um, it's not something that we ourselves directly use in uh, production anywhere right now, so it's possible that uh, this uh, fell a little bit behind. Um, if you have any issues about that, then feel free to, to contact us uh, either on the World's Haskell Issue Tracker or uh, here during Zurich hack or um, uh, any other place. And uh, then we can try to see if, if something broke in the meantime and needs fixing. Um, any option to have access control for the cache? Uh, yes. So uh, Bazel can be configured such that only CI pushes to the cache and uh, developers only read from the cache. I would strongly recommend that because otherwise it's very easy to sort of leak arbitrary local stuff uh, into the cache. Um, now that said, um, your cache, uh, there are various backends that Bazel supports through gRPC or uh, just um, uh, GCS buckets or something like this. Uh, so uh, the actual access control um, is done on those backends directly. So with a GCS bucket, for example, uh, you need to configure it such that only certain tokens have right access or something like this and then provision those to CI. Um, so that's something that's a bit more specific to how exactly you set up the cache. Mm -hmm. um, Andreas asks, Andreas Kalberg asks, uh, would this integrate with GHC IDE or the Haskell language server nicely? The um, workflow you showed earlier. Yes, so um, we do have <clears throat> uh, work for this to uh, so we're using the same Haskell REPL rule that I showed just now uh, to generate a high BIOS uh, file that can be used by a custom high BIOS cradle um, to set up um, a high BIOS environment which then can be used by GHC IDE uh, and HLS um, it's uh, a bit more in an experimental state right now so uh, there are some edge cases uh, where it uh, where it'll fall over um, but uh, it's something that uh, we have worked on and um, there's also some setup instructions on Haskell.build and um, uh, yeah, if, if you encounter any issues with that, then also uh, please raise them on the Rules Haskell uh, tracker. Adam asks, uh, can you zoom out a bit and discuss Bazel versus Shake? How should I choose a build system? Why shouldn't I go for the Haskell tool Shake? Right. Um, so uh, differences that come to mind there is that um, with Bazel, you get the uh, sandbox builds and all that to really ensure that your dependencies are uh, defined uh, completely and correctly. It's been a while that I used Shake, I have to admit, but last, as far as I remember, it's sort of more like make in that um, if you forget to define a dependency um, and it happens to be scheduled in such a way that the dependency is there, then your build might succeed now and fail later. Um, uh, that is one thing. And then with Bazel, you benefit from an already existing uh, um, ecosystem of uh, rule sets for various kinds of languages. Um, and um, yeah, all the support for things like remote caching, remote execution. Now, I, as far as I know, with uh, Shake, there is also, um, how's it called? Forgot the name, but there, there, I think there is a version of, of remote caching, remote execution as well for Shake. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's 
Is there the difference? Yeah. Is there a conceptual difference, like thinking of um, build systems a la carte um, between the two? Uh, right. So uh, one big difference that comes to mind um, is that with Bazel, you have a static dependency graph. So you don't have dynamic dependencies, meaning you cannot have a Bazel build action which produces output that modifies the build graph itself. Um, and this is a design decision put in place by Google uh, to manage their uh, very large monorepository. They just want to ensure that they're able to have a static dependency graph upfront, do efficient scheduling of that, and sort of have no surprises uh, down the line. Um, uh, whereas, uh, if I remember correctly, with Shake, you can have express dynamic dependencies and modify the build graph um, uh, during the build. Mm -hmm. So, sort of, uh, Shake is monadic and, and Bazel is applicative is kind of a hand wavy way to, to put that. Cool. Um, maybe we leave like 10 seconds of silence for anyone who wants to ask a question, um, you know, switching on their video and uh, microphone. That's that's fine too. Sure, sounds good. Um, so then one more chat question is, would you recommend Bazel if only Haskell and other, um, so for only Haskell and other languages written in Haskell? So basically if you're not that polyglot. Right. Um, so it may depend a little bit on what these other languages written in Haskell exactly do in your project. Um, so for example, if, if your project is really mainly a Haskell only project that you want to pack, publish on Hackage and you're only really using um, the uh, Cabal and Stack build tools or, or something like this, um, and uh, you're not currently facing any issues with build times or uh, something of that sort, so it's, it's a relatively small uh, project, um, then you may not get all that much benefit uh, out of porting over to Bazel. We've seen here that it, it takes a little bit more of setup to get it working. Um, however, if your custom languages, um, and then sort of the, the compiler, I'm guessing that you're building in that project as well, uh, then uh, sort of integrate into your overall build and dependency graph as well. So you might have targets that are uh, compiling code in your own language using your own compiler, and then they're becoming targets themselves that you can build, and maybe they depend, interdepend, and maybe you have a final deployable that contains some stuff like this. Then all of a sudden, your project really is a polyglot project, right? Um, so then uh, you might very well benefit uh, from Bazel. So you could write a custom Bazel extension for your own language. Um, and your own compiler tool chain and have Bazel built both the Haskell part and your own uh, custom language as well in, in one uh, language. Mm -hmm. Nice. So um, we are out of time, but um, maybe a last uh, information for the, for the participants is uh, if uh, Tweak is hiring, uh, where, where can they reach you and can they somehow um, have an informal chat with uh, somebody from Tweak if they are generally interested and have more questions. How do they go about that? Absolutely. So uh, yeah, we're in the Tweak channel here in uh, Discord. Uh, so feel free to contact us there. And otherwise, uh, you can also write at uh, hello at tweak.io if you're interested about uh, career options. And you can take a look at uh, tweak.io slash careers. Uh, we have a couple of job openings posted there. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask in the, in the Tweak channel. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Andreas. And uh, thanks to everybody who joined. Again, uh, super big interest. I'm very happy about that. And um, I would say enjoy the rest of Zurich. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. And, and thank you, everyone else, for the, uh, the discussion. Thanks. Bye.